we have a process when we're talking about consensus making and so on, where a person may have a concern. And so when he's got a concern that's bothering him uh, enough, he or she will tell their, one of their relatives or maybe even a friend, tell them, can you go and invite some people and have these people come and speak to my concern? The person will go out and invite the people, feast them, and eventually will say to the group, my friend over here, my relative over here has this concern and he wants you to speak to it. Okay? And so everybody takes turns which is now almost rhetorically known as talking circles. And after everybody has spoken, however many rounds it may take, we, you know, the person will say, okay, you have heard the people speak, okay? Now, take what they have said to resolve your concern. In other words, they don't, the spokesperson doesn't come along and say, well, here's what the people have said, you do A, B, C, D. No, and the person just sits there and listens. So this notion of talking and so forth, all our modern uh, toys, our electronics, whether it be cell phones, TVs, and all that stuff, in fact, prevent us from, from talking. So these kids are growing up with these cell phones and they're not developing relationships. If they are developing any relationship, it is with the cell phone. And consequently, when they have to deal with real people, hey, they don't have the skills. If we continue down the road that we're going, uh, as fun as they may be, as convenient as they may be, these toys, you know, I think our intellectual capacities are going to decline. In other words, these tacit infrastructures that we carry around stand in the way, okay? Stand in the way and they become blocks to communication. The whole notion about dialogue is putting those barriers aside so that we can communicate. Obama has been going around the world. He's going over there to, to communicate with people, which the previous presidents have not were doing. In other words, he's trying to start a dialogue. So dialogue is a very good instrument. Dialogue is a very good process for developing you know, communication. Apparently, there was this uh, scientist who was wondering why certain discoveries, mainly in science, were coming out of certain universities. When he finished his study and he was interviewed, and they asked him, well, why? He says, they have world-class restaurants. The restaurant acts as the meeting place where all these people come together. And in other words, that's where they get intellectually nurtured. It's over coffee. So in other words, this whole notion about science, scientific discoveries, really works best in a collaborative setting. And again, the notion about relationships which is a very strong value in Native America. Everything is about relationships. Again, this notion of dialogue, communication, and so on, is a very important factor that has to be, you know, reflected upon very seriously in our modern world. Dialogues, generally speaking, do not have agendas. They do not, they are not ordinary conversations. They are not forums for 
uh, saying, okay, as a result of this dialogue, as a result of this gathering, we are now going to pass a motion and do the following. Dialogue is about listening. It's not just about talking. It's about deep listening. From that point of view, for me, I'm the listener. I listen to everything everybody says. As uh, Glenn Perry was mentioning, uh, we, uh, we usually use a, uh, a question. I don't tell anybody in advance what we're going to be talking about and what my kickstart question is going to be. Why? Well, because when we're talking about tacit infrastructures, unloading and so on, well, if, you, if everybody knows what we're going to be talking about in advance, well, they're going to come with this agenda. Getting rid of tacit infrastructures, it's easier said than done. It's hard to do, okay? Lots of people end up saying, geez, if I put everything I believe in and so on aside, who am I? Am I, you know, the, you know, in other words, they're scared to have a loss of identity, see? And I'm going to say, well, no, don't be scared. Dialogues are safe places where people don't make judgments, do not put value judgments. It's not that we can't express different opinions. You know, we're not saying everybody has to agree. And like I said, slow but sure, in many cases, that those tacit infrastructures creep back in, you know, and so on. So it's almost like you have to keep reminding them. So that's, that's the real challenge. Once they get into the groove, all of a sudden you can just see that the things change and everybody, oh, you know, relaxes and they, they go from there. And that's when the dialogue really takes off and they don't want to stop. I end up having to, okay, the dialogue has finished, you know, so process-wise, some of the people that have been in our dialogues um, always make the point in, you know, some people have interpreted the uh, Bohmian dialogues to be situations where when a person speaks, okay, and when he, he or she finishes, the next speaker has to more or less pick up the thread where the other person left off. In our dialogues, we don't require that. In native thought, <clears throat> asymmetrical notions are a matter of everyday thought. In Western notions, you have to have the connections. So between the pure Bohmian notion and the type of dialogues we run, yeah, we share the spirit. The, the spirit of dialogue is very common to both. The procedural aspect of it might be a little bit different. But the scientists, let's use them as the example. They come from Eurocentric perspective. And the language they speak is, of course, mathematics. If you can look at mathematics as a funnel, working from the point outward, the wider you go outwards, the greater uh, spectrum of maneuverability you get out of mathematics. You start to have all these little symbols and so on that start to make for uh, deviations, deviations from what you would call the actual thinking norm, okay? What are those deviations trying to uh, project? They're trying to project things like uh, flux, changes, you know, transformations, and so on, which in normal English thinking would not be allowed for, see? But mathematics has all these symbols and so on, okay? Well, 
from a native point of view, from a Blackfoot point of view, all those notions about flux, transformations, etc., are all again part of everyday thought. What the mathematics is trying to achieve, we already have incorporated into everyday thought. And the example that I use probably most often is the notion of time and space. See, when Einstein said that time and space were the same thing, he caused a revolution. Well, time and space in, in Blackfoot thought is all hat. The very thinking process that is already there in Native American thought, whether it be Blackfoot, whether it be Navajo, whether it be Hopi, is to a very large extent what is trying to be achieved by science through the mathematics. Let me give you my latest example of that. Okay. Over in Geneva, Switzerland, is the Large Hadron Collider, the most expensive scientific toy you can think of, is attempting to come up with an explanation of the Higgs particle, the notion of energy and matter, and what causes the transformation from an from energy into matter. From that point of view, we could also from, go, so, go back from matter back into energy. If you want to use those as two posts, okay, over here in the middle is what the scientists refer to as the Higgs field. The Higgs is basically named after the scientist who came up with the idea. According to the, their mathematical formulations, the scientists are saying there has to be a particle that causes the transformation. And this particle is supposed to be right here. But they have not been able to prove its existence. If you're looking at it, from a Native American point of view, that transformation is what we would refer to as the spirit. Part of the difference in scientific thinking is we simply accept, that is from a Native point of view, we simply accept that that's the case. Whereas the scientists are, you know, from this Eurocentric notion, we're trying to go that A to B to C to D to explain why it exists.